con Ober Cantone Bantuba por YouTube, que fue Haluka. Es mi man Thomas Westbrookast. Hoy en día, vamos a organizar sobre el origen del lenguaje. Specifically, we'll be learning about the Tombaut to Babel. Y se etimos. ¡Dabai! Just how many spoken languages have existed in the world and where did all of this language diversity come from? Almost every ancient culture has had some kind of myth attempting to explain the origin of languages. Because it's such a universal question, it's such a universal story, with many variations of course. In one Aztec tradition, mute children are each given a unique language by a magical dove. A Salishan myth tells how an entire village is split over an argument about duck noises leading to an unfortunate rift in the entire community. And here we thought YouTube drama was bad. Over time, they drifted further apart and began speaking different languages. Other myths blame the confusion of languages on cannibalism, trickster gods, a madness-inducing famine, and in one tradition, it's because some jerk ate a couple of hummingbird eggs. There are as many myths as there are human cultures, but by far the most famous language origin myth is the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. According to the biblical book of Genesis, a worldwide flood has just wiped out all but eight people. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. God tells them to be fruitful and fill the earth, which they start to do before humanity clusters in one city and begins building a giant tower to reach to the heavens. That ticks God off, so he confuses their languages. No longer able to communicate, they disperse throughout the world. Now, that's just a brief summary, and there are plenty of comically absurd aspects to that story, which I'm not going to cover in this video, because I already did in my reboot of Animated Bible Myths. I'll put a link to that video below in case you missed it. What I do want to look at in this video is the historicity of this story, and whether there's any evidence indicating that it actually happened, or if it goes against all of the archaeological findings and scientific data. Immediately after the flood, the Bible's author lays out an 11-generation family tree of Noah's descendants and says how long each of them lived. So while the author is anonymous, it's pretty clear that this is not a first-hand witness to any of this, but they're writing this down way after the fact. How much later? Well, we don't know, but bear in mind that the earliest written fragments of scripture we have are from almost 2,000 years later. Once they've given the who's who of Noah's family tree, the very first story after the flood is the Tower of Babel, which it says was built in the plain of Shinar. Shinar is mentioned eight other times throughout the Bible, and we know exactly where it is. It's right here, in Babylonia, specifically this little region between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. It doesn't technically say who built it, but it's widely believed to have been a guy named Nimrod, because according to the Bible, Babel was built shortly after the flood before everyone started to spread out and populate the earth, and the Bible says that Nimrod built the city of Babylon where the tower was, and that he later went on to build several other cities in Shinar before dispersing to Assyria and building four more cities there. And this is where the Bible runs into major insurmountable problems. First off, Nimrod is Noah's great-grandson. There have only been three generations since the flood wiped out all but eight people. Who exactly is he building these cities with? See, we know that generation one consisted of just three couples, Noah's sons and their wives. Combined, they have 16 boys, and since human biology dictates that the average natural sex ratio for humans is 0.95 girls for every boy, and we'll be generous and round up, then that gives us a total of 32 people or 16 couples by generation two. From here, the Bible only follows three of these people's lineages, but even if we assume that each of these 16 couples had 14 kids, which is over twice the country with the highest total fertility rate on Earth, that gets us only 224 babies for generation three. And that's assuming an infant mortality rate of zero, that no one died in childbirth, and no one died of disease or starvation, scrounging for food after the flood. And remember, this is before modern medicine, and this entire generation would be severely inbred. It also assumes that everyone had kids, and that there were no no violent deaths, which is absurd because based on a wealth of anthropological data, we know that hunter-gatherer societies have traditionally been significantly more violent than urban societies are today, and they had much shorter life expectancies. So by the time Nimrod arrives on the scene, if we really, 
really fudge the numbers in the Bible's favor, then we can grant them up to 264 people on the entire planet. A more realistic number would be about a third of that, or about 88 people. And yet the Bible has Nimrod founding two great kingdoms with four sprawling cities each. We haven't even looked at the archaeological evidence yet, and the Bible's already debunked itself. But I'm not done. See, the cities that Nimrod allegedly founded were Babylon, Uruk, and Nineveh, all of which are very well-known cities in Mesopotamia, and five other cities which are listed which historians still aren't certain as to where exactly they're located. Now, here's the crazy thing. The first three cities we know a lot about, and they weren't all founded by the same person. In fact, they weren't even all founded by the same culture or at the same time period. Uruk is so old that there are multiple cities built on top of each other dating back to 5000 BCE. Nineveh shows signs of occupation as early as a thousand years earlier in 6000 BCE. And both of these cities would thrive for thousands of years before Babylon was built in 2300 BCE. In fact, 800 years before the founding of Babylon, Uruk was an absolute powerhouse, a sprawling city so big that archeologists estimated its population at 40,000 residents. So unless this Nimrod dude lived for 3000 years, then this is a big fat swing and a miss. As for the tower, Sure, some of these cities built stepped towers called ziggurats, and these may have been the inspiration for the biblical story written a millennium and a half later by Jews living in Babylonian captivity. But unlike the biblical narrative, these towers weren't abandoned, they were completed and had temples at the top of them that were fully operational. There is an unfinished ziggurat in the city of Eridu, but it was built over the remains of multiple temples since Eridu was not a new city when this ziggurat's construction began. And it also wasn't the first ziggurat ever built. And by the time the ziggurats at Babylon and Eridu were constructed, the ancient Egyptians had already completed the massive stepped pyramid of Djoser. They had a very distinct language and were beginning to record written records and hieroglyphics. Not only that, but archeologists have found jewelry, precious metals, and lapis lazuli as early as 3300 BCE in Nakata, Egypt. Egypt doesn't have lapis lazuli mines. There was only one source of this blue rock in the ancient world. It was mined and traded from the Kokcha River Valley in northeastern Afghanistan. That means that there were trade routes all the way from Afghanistan to southern Egypt long before the first ziggurat was ever constructed. And a thousand years before Babylon was even a city. Now, you may be wondering how archeologists are able to tell how old something is and whether or not these dating methods are actually reliable. So I'll be covering that in an upcoming video. But first, I'm not quite done with the Tower of Babel. Since there are so many different ways to disprove this story, I'm gonna have to do a part two on it. If you'd like to see either of those videos, make sure that you're subscribed to my channel and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss the video. If you enjoyed this video and appreciate the work that I'm doing spreading scientific skepticism and critical thinking, please consider supporting my work with a per video pledge on patreon.com slash holy kool-aid or with a monthly pledge on Subscribestar. I also accept one-time donations on PayPal. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you doubly for your support. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.